in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, it was, uh, it was fun for me studying this out and just really understanding what Ecclesiastes is all about, even its name. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes in Hebrew is called Koheleth. And the word koheleth in Hebrew, I'm, I'm sure you guys know it, means the preacher. Amen? And so, actually, the first scripture there in chapter 1, verse 1 in, in Hebrews would translate the words of the preacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Solomon, of course. And so, in the Hebrew Bible, this particular book is called koheleth. I'm sure you knew that, but I didn't. You say, well... How did he get the name Ecclesiastes? Well, in the Greek, we have ekklesia, which means the called out. We refer to it as God's people. And so Ecclesiastes is really just the Greek word for the one who calls God's people to gather. The preacher. That's what it means. That's all it means is the preacher. The one who gathers God's people. And so the truest application of this particular book is not to non-Christians, though obviously all principles apply to every person around the world. Amen, church? But this book is actually written to God's people. And I think this is going to be exciting for us as we study it, because I think there's some really some awesome challenges for us as disciples of Jesus Christ. So the title of the lesson is simply... The meaning of life. Because see, sometimes God's people forget the meaning of life. Let's look at chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utter meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? A generation comes and a generation goes, but the earth remains forever. Church said, Amen. You know, we know that uh, in the King James Version, it says, Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Another translation says, Emptiness, emptiness, all is emptiness. And it says, What does man gain for all his toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation comes and a generation goes. You know, a group of people graduate in June, and then a new group of people come on into high school. You with me right here, guys? It's the same old, same old as we're gearing on up here for a new school year. And you know, for a lot of, of God's people, sadly, their relationship with God has dissipated to the point where they begin to look at life and feel that life is vanity, feel that life is empty. Feel that, that, that life doesn't have satisfaction. You know, I remember there was this uh, cheer that uh, uh, was, was given by the cheerleaders at my, at my school. I, I, I played football in high school, and it wasn't the most glorious football team ever. We were, we were three and five my senior season. And yet they had this one cheer whenever we would score a touchdown, which wasn't very often. And you can understand the cheer. The cheer would just simply go. The girls would go, but are you satisfied? And the fans would go, oh, no. And they go, but are you satisfied? And the fans go, oh, no. And, of course, we scored so few touchdowns. It was really a true cheer. <laughs> you know, of course, that, that's for a lot of Christians. Are you satisfied? And a lot of disciples say, well, oh, no. You know, of course, there is that, that powerfully deep movie, Wayne's World. Yeah. And there's a line from Wayne's World that goes, Thought I had mono for an entire year. Turns out I was just bored. You know, a lot of disciples, man, I think something's wrong with me. No, it turns out I'm just bored. And it's shocking, but disciples can get bored in their Christianity. And sadly, when the cry comes, but are you satisfied? They go, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless, all is vanity, all is emptiness. And the preacher says, we need to get together. And so this is the message of the meaning of life. You know, it's very interesting. 
He concludes the book of Ecclesiastes in two verses, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. And Solomon says, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Now, the Hebrew right there is more powerfully than what the English translates. He says, this is what life is all about. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is, the, this is what makes man complete. This is what, what gives him satisfaction. This is what gives him fulfillment. Now, of course, we take a New Testament view on things, and I want us to go quickly into the New Testament to amplify this understanding that when we fear God and keep his commandments, this is what makes us whole. Turn to John chapter 14. In John 14, we're familiar with the first part of the chapter where Jesus tells the disciples, I am the way and the truth and life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Later on in the chapter, though, he says this in verse 15. He says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Wow. Remember last week we talked about trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen, church? Look at Jesus. If you love me, you will obey my commands. You say, well, is that the only time it's written? Well, let's just see. Let's drop on down to verse 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Wow. Just a couple verses later, he reiterates. What does it mean to love God? It means to obey God's word from your heart. Look at verse 23. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. Wow, he lays it out right here, and he lays out the axiom. He says, those people that love me obey my word. Those people that don't obey my word, they don't love me. Now, there's a lot of people in America, there's a lot of people around the world that feel a love for God. But the Bible says to love God is to obey his word. Are you with me right here? See, we, we've got to ask ourselves, is that our heart? Look at Jesus' heart. Verse 31. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father commanded me. Is that your heart? When you see a scripture, do you respond with your heart to obey God exactly? Are you with me right here, guys? And you see, when we do that, the Bible teaches that there is satisfaction, that there is a sense that we are made complete, that our life has fulfillment and has meaning. Now, let's get back to the book of Ecclesiastes. And there are three challenges that I believe the book has for us in a very timely way for our congregation. Remember, let me remind you again, this is written to God's people. This is a challenge to God's people. And the first point is very simple. Survey without delay. Survey without delay. You've got to look at your life. Verse 12, chapter 1. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that's done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I've seen all the things that are under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Can you picture a little kid on a fall day trying to grab the wind? Just trying to grab it. And he grabs it, he can feel it, but there's nothing there. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I've grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much wisdom and knowledge. I mean, Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and of also madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. And all of the students in the crowd said, Amen. I mean, the more they're piling on you there at school and high school and middle school and college going, Oh my gosh, I got to learn all that by Friday. You know what I'm talking about right here? You know, for some people, they think that, that knowledge, wisdom, is the way to find fulfillment, even amongst God's people. I still remember back in seventh grade, teachers trying to demonstrate that we could never know everything. And she, was, she said, okay, here, here's, here's what we now know. And she got a flashlight out, turned out all the lights. 
and shone a flashlight on the wall. It says what we know in science is represented by the light. And what we don't know is represented by all the darkness. Then she took a few more steps back and says, you know, as the years have gone by, we've learned more and more. We know more of the light. But we also now understand, because the circumference is larger as you draw back, we know that we don't know more. Are you with me right here, guys? And so if your quest is wisdom and knowledge, there's, there's always more that you don't know. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. Are you with me right here? And so right here, Solomon says, man, wisdom, knowledge just struck me grief and vexation. So he changes his plan and his meaning for life. Verse 1. I thought in my heart, come now. I'll test you with pleasure to find out what's good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. He's being sarcastic. My mind's still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. You know, right here, he says, man, I thought... I could find the meaning of life through knowledge and wisdom. He said, man, I just found that to be a burden. So I think what life's all about is it's a party. I'm going to party. And, you know, as a a non-Christian, I know some of you guys understand. I literally lived in college from weekend to weekend. I could not wait to get through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the vexation of knowledge. Amen, guys. And come to the fun of the weekend. Are you with me right here? And people live from weekend to weekend. You know, we have disciples that live from weekend to weekend. And sadly, they're they're trying to embrace the world, the drinking, the party, the fun. And then they don't wonder, well, why is my life empty? Why is my Christianity boring? I'm looking, I'm looking. Well, read on, verse 4. Solomon says, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves and flourishing trees. I brought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in the house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. He says, man, I, I know what will bring me fulfillment. I'm going to build my dream house. You know, you know how it is. You get married, you go, okay, we're going to have a cranking house, but then we'll have a better cranking house, and then someday we'll have our dream house. What a lot of people don't know is there are mortgage payments with the dream house. And the burden gets more and more and more. So, man, I thought the house would give me joy, and instead it's just giving them burdens. Are you with me right here, guys? A lot of guys and a lot of women says, okay, I'm going to do great projects. I'm just going to pour myself into my work. And we will do cranking projects. But then at work, they have deadlines, they have expectations, and it's just crushing as it eats up your time and your energy. You know, on down, he says, well, he says, I was rich. Of course, he got that from his dad, right, David? He says, man, (laughs) I had more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem. I amassed silver and gold for myself. And so many people think, man, when I get rich... And rich is something we believe is just a little bit more than we have. Very few people consider themselves rich. So I'm not rich, but when I have that much, I'll be rich. But when they get, they go, well, I'm not really rich. I wouldn't have that much, I'll be rich. Wealth is so deceitful. And they think when they have wealth, they'll have happiness. But that is not the meaning of life, Solomon says. Are you with me right here, guys? Well, read on down. He says, I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the hearts of men. You know, when when Solomon wanted to kind of get down a little bit, he didn't buy a CD player with with CDs and stuff. He just had the live band come on in. You know, if he wanted to hear U2 or Coldplay, he wouldn't flip in the CD. He'd just say, hey, bring the guys on in. I want to hear them. You know what I'm talking about right here? Now, that's rich. Are you with me right here? But you know, it's pleasurable to hear the music, but in and of itself, music is not the meaning of life. A lot of people use it as an escape. It's an escape because they don't want to think about their lives. And then he says, well, then I tried a harem, a whole bunch of women. Sex, that's, that's got to fire you on up. But you know something? That's not the meaning of life. 
Particularly when there's no relationship attached. And there are a lot of disciples who go, oh, when I get married, then I'm going to be a happy disciple. No, what happens when you get married is you're going to have more discipling. Because your sin is going to come out in just cranking time. We, we, we are so deluded and we start buying the, the world's dreams. And we miss the meaning of life. Look at verse 10. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. Now, we, we've got some people that shop like that. Now, I, hey, I didn't say men or women. I said we got some people. I tried to stay neutral on that verse right there. Okay, ease up here, church. Ease up. I'm just reading the scriptures. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work and... This was the reward for my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Man, he poured himself into all these things. His life became hectic, burdensome, vanity. Emptiness, meaningless. But you know something? You've got to admire Solomon. He does something a lot of people don't have the guts to do. Verse 11. Three. Yet when I serve, they, all that my hands have done. When was the last time you took a step back from your life and say, hold it? Am I satisfied? Three. Am I really fulfilled in my walk with God? Now, it's very interesting. There's a perspective that we need to add, and it's it's given all the way through the book of Ecclesiastes. Look at verse 15. Then I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will also overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaninglessness. For the wise men like the fool will not be long remembered. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man too must die. So I hated life. Because the work that's done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless. A chasing after the wind. He's talking to the people of God. He said, I hated life. It's a chasing after the wind. Particularly when you add the perspective that we're all going to die. Right. Yeah, I was able to do some research this weekend on the mortality rate in Portland. It's 100%. It's 100%. To put it crudely, we're all going to die. And so you cannot, you cannot survey your life unless you bring into your heart, I am not always going to be here. I am going to die. What is going to bring meaning in my life? Now, granted, many of these things bring joy and pleasure for a short time. But they don't ultimately bring fulfillment and satisfaction. You know, it's kind of interesting. A couple of days ago, I got a call from an old friend. His name was Danny. And I first met Danny many years ago. It was at a juncture when my family... Uh, my three kids and Elena and I were trying to bring some sanity to our lives. Anytime your kids get into their, you know, the middle school years and, you know, you got one doing basketball, another doing dance, another gymnastics, another tennis, you're going, oh my gosh, just driving everywhere and they're driving you crazy. You know what I'm talking about? And I said, guys, guys, do you think we could just try one sport and focus on one thing? So I said, I got everybody to agree. Okay, we'll try tennis. Well, Danny's the, the coach that we found. And Danny was an incredible guy. This guy won a national championship at UCLA. He went on the Pro Tour and won the New Zealand Open. He was ranked number 88 in the world. And the guy was was an awesome guy, outgoing, sharp guy. Jewish in his background. And yet, as we got to know him, he started opening up about his life. And the sadness. 
On the outside, he looked awesome. His accomplishments were incredible. But he's going through a divorce. He was pained because his wife had such a bad attitude towards him that she didn't want him to be with the kids very much. She misread all of, uh, all of his intentions and put the worst of motives on him. And it was just killing Dan. And finally, as, as we talked and he got to see the family and meet people from the church, he understood there was something better. Amen. And five months later, Danny was baptized into Christ. Amen? Now, the cool thing is that today he's married in the kingdom. He's got a couple of kids in the kingdom. And he's preaching the gospel. He's a full-time minister. Is that awesome? I mean, God works in incredible ways. You know, the couple that was uh, introduced right at the beginning of the service, uh, Jason and Alyssa Dimitri, they, they are awesome. I got to have lunch with them yesterday, and they're just a, a, a wonderful couple. And, of course... Uh, Alyssa's the daughter of uh, Lance and Connie, and, and uh, you know, Lance and Connie have come on out here. They've grown strong in the Lord. They're some of our most powerful house church leaders. And yet, Jason and Alyssa, when, when all the garbage hit our fellowship, it hit their faith. And they drifted. And, of course, bottom line, as we talked about yesterday, everybody's responsible for their own heart. Are you with me right here? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in a good church, bad church, hot church, lukewarm church. You're responsible to God. And their lives drifted out there, and, and their, their life just became just a hurtful time. Well, Lance had kind of been reaching out to him, and I had a chance to get on the phone with, with Jason, and Jason was just telling me his life situation. And Jason made an incredible salary, over six figures. And I said, dude, you have to decide what is the most important in your life. Is it God? Is it your wife and your kids? What is it? If you decide that, then you'll know what you need to do as far as coming to Portland. Two days later, he resigns his job, and they're on their way out here. And, of course, they're here today. Is that awesome, church? You see, you, 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 you've got you've to gotta be willing to survey without delay. Jason said, wow, I, I got all of this. But I don't have any meaning in my life. Do you have the guts to survey without delay your life? And then to make the radical decisions to find true meaning, satisfaction, and purpose in life. Let's go on to a very fun chapter. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Now, in Ecclesiastes 5, we, we like to use this a lot in our contribution, our giving, and, and it's appropriate. It's appropriate, but it has a much broader, I think, application. In verse 1, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, and you are on earth, and let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. And do not protest the temple messenger, the preacher. My, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, stand in awe of God. Our second point is we got a dream and scheme. We got a dream and scheme. You know, right here he talks about vows. And, of course, one of the things that, that is just awesome, almost every week we get a chance to see someone make the vow. Jesus is Lord. And he's making that good confession before men, but he is making a vow before God. That no more what happens in his life, he is going to make Jesus the Lord of his life. That's an incredible vow. And in this church, it's not a cheap vow. We study the Bible with people. We lay out, hey, you've got to be a disciple, and then you've got to be baptized. We, we really want people to have on their heart what it really means to make that the most important decision of life. You say, well, why is that the most important decision of life? Because upon that decision, all the rest of your decisions are made. Is that intense? Of course, 
the second biggest decision of our life is really who we marry. And, I mean, you remember the vow there, guys? For richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, forsaking all others, so long as we both shall live. You, you, you remember that? Olivia, you remember that? Just got married about a month ago. Amen. Just, just a little reminder right there. See, that, that, that vow, that's a vow you're making to God. So listen, for rich or for poor, that guy may take his job, but that God, I'm going to stay in love with him. She may get very sick, but that God, I'm going to stay with her. We may have nothing, but we got each other. That's a serious vow. And that's not a cheap vow for the disciple. But you know, the application of this scripture is even broader than that. The vows he talks about here are the vows of dreams. Because you see, God has created man to have dreams. And without dreams, you're not going to be satisfied. And even your Christian walk will eventually become boring. Boring. You know, there, there are so many different types of vows that we make. One that I was challenged to do is, you know, I saw myself over the last couple of years slowly putting on some weight. You know what I'm talking about? And many times I go, you know, I need to go on a diet. Three days later, boom. You know, I mean, we're talking Krispy Kremes. I mean, it's... And finally, you know, I just said, you know, daggone it. Enough is enough. And praise God, you know, the Holy Spirit brought Lance Underhill in my life. And I started my body for life. You know, I'm ashamed to say, May 1st, I weighed 220 pounds. But I'm down to 194. That's, that's, that's 26 pounds off. Now, I still got some going to go. But, you know, so I'll be honest with you. It's been tough. It's been tough. You say, well, you've been going now for several weeks. It's still tough. It's so hard when you see your thin wife eating everything in front of her. One would think there'd be sensitivity and mercy before she would order something. Sometimes I look over there and I feel the belt go out a little bit. But you know some A dream must be pursued. At all costs, you've got to be committed. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. Of course, we need to have kingdom dreams. Amen? And there are many areas of kingdom dreams. First of all, there's leadership. I mean, to be a Bible talk leader or a deacon or an elder, an elder's wife or deacon's wife, an evangelist, a woman's ministry leader. Then there are dreams in the area of service. I mean, to be in Kids' Kingdom or the teen ministry or the, or the CR ministry or, or to be involved in Hope Worldwide or, or to just come up with a new specialized ministry. Or it could be in relationships. Maybe, maybe your dream is to find an awesome Christian wife or a Christian husband. Of course, you've got to start with a, a boyfriend. Amen. But, you, you know, you've got, you got a dream right there. You may have a dream for your family to become all Christians, but, but everybody needs a dream. Because, you see, if you've got nothing to live for, you've got nothing to die for. And a dream that propels your life is one you're willing to die for. You know, one of the interesting things about this congregation I love so much, I always tell people when they visit, say, hey, you know, we may not be the most talented congregation on earth, but daggone it, we got heart. We got heart. And we went through some horrific things in 2003. But I really believe that out of that, the Lord produced a heart in the disciple that is, that's just amazing. And one of the phenomena that I've never, 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 never seen before in all my years of ministry is the phenomena in leadership that we've seen. Now, as a young man, I was a campus minister, and it wasn't unusual, as Elaine and I worked the campuses, to have young men and young women say, oh, we want to go in the ministry. But the, the phenomena here in this congregation is that we've seen older guys say, listen, 
Hey, I know I'm 38 years old, Jay Hernandez says. I know I'm 40, and she says, listen, but, but we want to go in the ministry and serve people. Now, the ministry isn't for everybody. It, you have to have the right gifts, and you have to have the heart to be able to do it. But, but bottom line, I mean, it was amazing to see Jay and Angie go after it. I mean, it was amazing to see Matt and Helen. I mean, Helen is a double-degree person from Stanford. Who She'll be the first to say, I'm not a real natural spiritual person. Of course, I've not really met the natural spiritual person. <laughs> now, there's some people that think they are. But that's unspiritual. <laughs> but now, they're in the ministry. I mean, it's, it's awesome seeing people like Jeff and Debbie. I mean, Jeff's had a couple other marriages, and now he's still dreaming to be in the ministry. Is that incredible? And a lot of people, I have to laugh a little bit. They say, oh, yeah, uh, Michael and Michelle, they're some of the young people in our church. Um, you really need to get the calendar on out. They're both in their 30s. And for them to be thinking about the ministry, that's, that's incredible. That's a phenomenon. That's, that's, that, that, that's amazing. I mean, it was, it, was, it was powerful last night. We went out with uh, Nick and Denise. I mean, Nick's like, he's 46. And we're talking about, we're laying it all out. I said, bro, do you think I can make it? Do you think I can do it? I said, bro, you can do it. Your wife believes you can do it. God believes you can do it. But you've got to have the faith to do it. But you know something? Whether Nick does it or not, amen. But at 46, he's wrestling with this kind of a faith dream decision. What are you wrestling with? What is your kingdom dream? See, once you have a dream, you've got to have a scheme. Because for a lot of people, they talk, 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 talk. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. And they never do nothing. Because it's all talk. It's meaningless words. A dream without a scheme. Our third point is, is great. We've got to go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Get us a running start. In verse 1, Solomon writes, So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands, but no man knows whether love or hate await him. All share a common destiny. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. What is that common destiny? It's death. He says, this is, this is the bottom line. Now, look at this. Is, this, this is going to bring a smile to your face, guys. Verse 7. Verse 7. Go. Eat your food with gladness. Now, I, that one's, I can't do that one right now. Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm working up to that scripture. Okay. Go. Eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For it is now that God favors what you do. Always be clothed in white. Be pure. Always anoint your head with oil. Be with the Holy Spirit. Enjoy life with your one whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. Enjoy life with your wife. What's the third point? Have a blast while you last. Have a blast while you last. You know, I'll never forget. I, I, was, I was a young preacher. I was speaking at a, a conference out here in the West Coast, actually. And I'd finished speaking that night, and this, 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 this really old preacher, he's probably in the late 60s, he said, hey, Kip, you got anybody to go out with for dinner? I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here alone. He said, how about if I take you out for dinner? So he took me out and it was to this really dark restaurant. Here's this, and this guy was a Big man, about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, you know, white hair. Big man. And he says, tell me about your life. And I was able to finish with my life in about three minutes. <laughs> he says, I want to tell you about my life. I go, okay. <laughs> it's a very foreboding setting, you know. <laughs> it's dark. This is a big guy. White hair. He says, I'm married to my third wife. And she's great. I love her a lot. 
He said, but one thing that I always do is I talk to every young man I can to love the wife of their youth. So I love my wife. We were married young, and we had an incredible life. It was awesome. And then two years into the marriage, she had an aneurysm on her esophagus, and she bled to death in the guy's arms. And he says, the love of my life was gone. My second wife committed adultery on me. My heart was empty. He said, God has blessed me with a great third wife. But I want you to understand, as a young man, you better treasure what you've got. Go on. Amen. I go back to my room, my hotel room. I'm there all alone. Elena's out there going, Lord, can't wait to get back home. You know? I mean, guys, we take so much for granted what we've got. It's awesome what we've got. It's incredible. And he says, man, enjoy your food. Well, that's not too tough. But some of you guys look like you're doing a good job at that. Remember, Lance Underhill is still part of the fellowship. You can go talk to him about diet for life, you know, body for life there. Drink your wine with a joyful heart. Be fired up. God favors what you do. That's awesome. Just have a blast while you last. Well, this kind of leads us to the ultimate challenge that I think faces our church and every church. It's called aging. Go chapter 12. Verse 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. Well, now, when I was studying this, this book out, I, I knew this scripture. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. That's an awesome scripture, and we need to obey that. Amen? But then it hit me. I, I read on it. It hit me for the first time. It says, before the days of trouble come. Now, hold on, let me, let's break this on down. Remember the creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come. <gasps> That's when you get older. <laughs> the Bible says it's synonymous. Getting older is the days of trouble. Oh, my goodness. He makes that analogy even down here. It says, uh, and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. Well, of course, the setting over is, is in Israel. And Israel's like Portland. In the wintertime, it rains a lot. And he says, it's the wintertime of your life. It's the winter time of your life. The days of trouble. He says, what are the days of trouble going to be like? Well, let's, let's break it down. Verse 3. He makes an analogy towards the person being like a house. He says in verse 3, when the keepers of the house tremble. Now, what are the keepers of the house? Well, they're your arms and your hands, right? So that's when you get older. You know how sometimes older people shake a little bit? He says, that's what's going to happen to some of you guys. He says, and the strong men stoop over. Wow. When the grinders cease because they're few. That means your teeth have fallen out. And those looking through the windows grow dim. And that's your eyes. They're, they're sunk in. They're darkened. And it's growing dim. You need glasses. When the doors of the street are closed. Well, that's, that's your lips speaking. You know, when, when people get really old, they don't say too much. And the sound of grinding fades. When men rise up at the sound of birds. You know, a lot of times people think when you get older, you just sleep a whole long time. Just the opposite. The older you get, the less hours you sleep. Because after a few hours, something starts hurting. And you sleep so lightly, a little bird chirps out. It's like, what was that? Of course, they can't hear you when they speak to you, but, but that go, they hear that little birdie out there. You know what I'm talking about? But all their songs grow faint. I mean, older guys have trouble singing. 
And it's, I mean, singing's fun. I can even tell my voice going. And I love to sing. I think it's awesome to sing. It's tough losing your voice. When men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, I mean, older people, they're a little bit afraid of this or afraid of that because they've lost their physical strength. They're afraid to take chances. When the almond tree blossoms, now, almond blossoms are white, so in other words, it's white hair. Now, some people just go, they skip white and go all the way to bald. (laughs) And the grasshopper drags himself along. Now, grasshoppers, I hope I'm not breaking this to you, but they jump. And they hop. So if you see a grasshopper kind of dragging himself, what's the concept? Well, he's lost his bounce and his step, and he's just gotten so heavy that he's just kind of dragging along. And then... And desire no longer is stirred. That's talking about sex right here. Not much sex at the end. Now that's just for the married people. Amen, guys? Amen. Right there. Okay, now. Then it says, Then the man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go out in the street. That's it. You die, you go to your eternal home, and then everybody goes around sad for a couple days. That's, that's the end of your days. Right there. Is that challenging or not, guys? See, we've got to really ask ourselves, are we enjoying life right now? Are you just happy? Are you fired up? you got to have a blast while you last. Now, of course, we understand all of this from a New Testament perspective. So let's close out in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes some of the most awesome words. In verse 15, I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The church said, Amen. look at verse 38. Therefore, my dear brothers... Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What an incredible promise. That when we die, we're going to be changed. Flesh and blood don't inherit the kingdom of God. It's your spirit. It's your soul. And we're going to be changed. I mean... Talk about an awesome promise. We're going to exchange this earthly body for a heavenly body. Amen, guys? And some of us, that is incredibly good news. Instead of body for life, you get body for eternity. But then, he says, man, it's, it's so awesome. Just thanks be to God that we get to be with God forever. That gratefulness should, should, should swell up in your heart. And then because of that, he says, therefore, my dear brother, stand firm. Because you're going to be with God. Because you have meaning in this life, stand firm. Let nothing move you. And then he says, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. This is saving souls. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, it's very interesting. We had a couple here from Santiago. Christian and Luis Amastoy. They're a number two couple in the church there in Santiago. They leave the campus of the teens. And in just a few short months, they're going to be planting the church in, in Concepcion. And our very last day, last Friday, I said, well, what did you think? And they said many kind things. And, but one of the things they said, we, said, bro, we are in awe of Victor and Sonia Gonzalez. Ten kids! Ten kids! And they are engaged in the work of God. 
I mean, it's pretty amazing. They got to walk with them several days. And, you know, Victor, we pay Victor some money, but he still has to do odd jobs to make it happen for his family. And it's pretty awesome because they got to hang with him. They got to talk with him. And they got to see their heart for God. See, Victor, like a lot of the other guys in this phenomenon like I've never seen before, he's 48 years old. Now, he was in the ministry before, but then through a whole set of circumstances, they let him go. And you talk about a devastating impact to be let go in your 40s. Wow. But he kept the dream and he kept pursuing it. I, I still remember when I first came, the, the, the part of the church that my heart really went out to here were the brothers and sisters that were primary Spanish-speaking. Of course, I think most everybody knows that my wife Elena is Cuban, and so uh, I have to have a special heart for the Latin people, amen, guys? <laughs> and I just felt for these people because I know they'd have to come to church and listen to me in English and have it translated. And if you ever go to another church and had to have the sermon translated, woo, that's challenging. You know what I'm talking about? We had seven of those brothers and sisters, and they just really hurt. But then the Holy Spirit blew into town, Victor and Sonia and the ten kids. And so, you know, Victor says, we'll take them. And he started preaching Spanish, and they just started perking on up. So he started with nine disciples. Every Sunday now downstairs, we have over a hundred adults in attendance. Does that fire you on up right now? I mean, God, God is moving. And, you know, we, we've got to look at this scripture in the light of, of, of heroes of the faith like this. It doesn't, it doesn't say, uh, dear, dear brothers of the faith, stand firm, let nothing move you as long as you have under eight kids. <laughs> let nothing move you until you're married. Let nothing move you, if you have a demanding, unless you have a demanding job. He say, no, no, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because this is the only thing. In which your labor is not in vain. Now I realize that some of us, we work real hard. We try real hard to get people to church or Bible talk and they just don't come. Well, the point of the scripture right here is your work is not in vain. Somebody is going to come. And somebody's life is going to change. But you know, I believe that God made evangelism... Yeah, to save a lost world. But I think he also made it for God's people. Oh, yeah. You know, it was kind of fun last night. Nick and Denise and Lena and myself were out eating. And the waiter we had was a great guy. And at the very end, we just started sharing our faith. And, uh, you know, we'd had a great spiritual discussion. But, but even at the end, we were just talking about God. We were talking about our lives. And I've been a Christian now for over 34 years. It still fires me up. To remember what Jesus has done for me. And so you see, as we stay evangelistic every day, we're reminded every day just how awesome it is to be a disciple. And we don't get into this meaningless, empty, boring life. That even the people of God can get into. You see, the challenge is clear today. we got to survey without delay. You need to take time today to look at your life. You got a dream, but you got a scheme. You got to figure out how to make that dream happen by faith. And then, bottom line, guys, let's just have a blast while we last. God bless.